Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In the chapter called Situation and Character in her work, The Second Sex, Simone de Beauvoir carries out a very interesting analysis of the position or situation of women in relation to what we could call the masculine world of logic, rules, principles, universals in general. And she's setting out a really penetrating analysis here of why it is that women are placed into a dilemma where they can't fully buy in because they know that some of this is, is BS and they also can't provide some sort of alternative to escape to. So they wind up mired in a sort of, as she's putting it, contrariness or another way she talks about it is resentment. There's a number of different synonyms that she's going, or modalities, if you prefer, that she's going to discuss. And this, this entire section begins where she says, woman is bound in a general way to contest foot by foot the rule of man, though recognizing his overall supremacy and worshiping his idols, hence that famous contrariness for which she has often been reproached. Now, why would she be contrary? Is it for the sake of being contrary? Does she win something in the process? No, it's coming out of a sort of reaction. She says, having no independent domain, she cannot oppose positive truths and values of her own to those asserted and upheld by males. She can only deny them. But her denial is not going to be a complete denial either. She says, her negation is more or less thoroughgoing according to the very, to the way respect and resentment are proportioned in her nature. But she knows all the faults of the masculine system and she has no hesitation in exposing them. So in a certain way, women are placed in a epistemologically privileged position when it comes to recognizing what's missing, where the gaps are in what she's going to call masculine logic. She goes on and she says, women don't have a grasp on the world of men because their experience does not teach them to use logic and technique. Inversely, masculine apparatus loses its powers at the frontiers of the feminine realm. And this is a very important point. Women's experiences, women's human experiences have typically been overlooked or denigrated or treated reductively by men or mis misappropriated and you know the wrong conclusions have been drawn from it precisely because they're not men's experiences and so she says that um there's a whole region of human experience which the male deliberately chooses to ignore because he fails to think it this experience, women live. And because women live it, women can think it. That's not to say that all men are necessarily cast out of possibly understanding anything about women and their lives and their experiences. But in general, that is in fact the case. I'm always struck myself by, uh, you know, I'll admit that, that myself, I, I get pointed out to me many things that I don't understand, but I'm often amazed at my male colleagues how little they seem to understand of things, particularly those who claim to, to be, you know, allies or feminists. Um, be that as it may, let's look now at this dilemma that, that she poses. She tells us that um, this, the experience of the man is intelligible but interrupted by blanks 
That of the woman is within its own limits, mysterious and obscure, but complete. There's something not lacking there, but something that's overlooked. And so she, she goes on and she says, it's understandable in this perspective, woman takes exception to masculine logic. Why? Because logic doesn't actually apply to as much as it, its pretensions are, which is to, to apply to everything. Logic claims to be universal. Uh, principles claim to be universal, covering every instance. But it doesn't really work that way, she says. So she, she says, well, why is this? There's, there's really a dilemma that, that the woman is placed within. She can either agree to masculine logic, principles, the way of the world, however you want to frame it. But if she does agree to it, then she's selling herself out. Why? Because to begin with, the masculine logic is not actually applicable to her experience. It's not the way that the world works in the portion that she's living in and reflecting upon and shoehorning it into the categories of masculine logic is not going to be particularly helpful. It's also a problem because like she says, masculine reasoning becomes an underhand form of force. Men's undebatable pronouncements are intended to confuse her. She's alienated. She's stuck within a framework that she's forced to then accept. What's the alternative? What's the other horn of the dilemma? Well, refuse it. But that's not really a live possibility either, unfortunately. You can reject the entire system, she says. Um, but what is she going to do in that case? De Beauvoir says she lacks the means to reconstruct society in different form. So it's kind of a damned if you do and a damned if you don't situation. And uh, one way of getting through a dilemma instead of just simply grasping the horns is to go through the horns of the dilemma. And this is what she says that many women in fact do. So this is where a lot of accusations of duplicity arise. She says she does not accept it as it is halfway between revolt and slavery. She resigns herself reluctantly to masculine authority on each occasion. He has to force her to accept the consequences of her half hearted yielding man pursues that chimera, a companion, half slave, half free in yielding to him. He would have her yield all the convincingness of the, uh, an argument, but she knows knows that he has himself chosen the premises on which his rigorous deductions depend. As long as she avoids questioning them, he will easily reduce her to silence, but he won't convince her because she senses his arbitrariness. So this is a third alternative to say, fine, I'll go along with your nonsense, which to you doesn't appear to be nonsense, but I'm not going to call it not nonsense. I'm going to treat it as it is. And I'll give you ground, but you're going to have to pull me along. And, you know, this is what leads to so many uh, arguments between people um, taking this masculine and feminine side saying, but I thought you agreed to this. Well, yes, but I understand it in a different way. And interestingly, this is part of what it means to be a free subject, to be able to reinterpret those who would bind us to absolutely fixed principles, you know, you agreed to this and this and this and this and this. They, they often don't realize how arbitrary those are and how it stands in the way of them achieving what it is that they're looking for in the other person. So that's one way out of the dilemma. And she talks about women experiencing ambiguity. She says, woman does not entertain the positive belief that truth is something other than men claim. She recognizes rather that there isn't any fixed truth. It's not only the changing nature of life that makes her suspicious of the principle of constant identity, nor is it the magic phenomena with which she's surrounded that destroy the notion of causality. It is at the heart of the masculine world itself. It is in herself as belonging to this world that she comes upon the ambiguity of all principle, of all value, of all that exists. What do we mean by ambiguity here? 
Ambiguity means that it, it, it's subject to interpretation because it can be understood or experienced or approached or dealt with in multiple ways. An ambiguous term is a word that means multiple things like seal. It can mean the pop singer. It can mean the animal. It can mean the thing that I'm doing to close off a meal. There used to be a thing called the seal a meal that we used to own. That's ambiguity. And so the settled rules, the absolutely fixed principles, they are also ambiguous. And I want to reiterate this point. She says she finds um, at the heart of the masculine world itself, whether men recognize it or not, and in herself as belonging to this world, she comes upon this ambiguity of all principle value of everything that exists. And she knows, as de Beauvoir says, that masculine morality as it concerns her is a hoax. What does that mean? Well, she goes on to explain. Men thunders his, forth his code of virtue and honor, but in secret he invites her to disobey it. So, you know, a prime example of this, as she talks about, is women should be pure, but you should be a whore for me in the bedroom. You should, you know, everybody should follow these fixed laws of morality. But in my case, and it, you know, with you, we'll violate the rules. And women see this over and over and over again. She actually uses that great line before about um, the uh, you know valet and and the hero. She a little bit later, she says um, she has the same cynicism because she sees man from top to toe as a valet sees his master, right? Women see that men over and over again are making demands that they don't sell, that themselves live up to, that they're being hypocrites, that they're being duplicitous. And at the same time, women suffer the burdens of this uh, most of the time, unless they happen to be lucky. So, you know, she, she, she says that women uh, view this masculine morality as a hoax. There's another thing that this leads to, which is not a particularly good thing. Du Beauvoir is not actually praising this as something that all of us should embrace. But she, she talks about women, here we go, not accepting logical principles and moral imperatives, skeptical about the laws of nature. Woman lacks the sense of the universal. To her, the world seems a confused conglomeration of special cases. So, you know, what, what does this lead to? Um, making exceptions in each case. She says, regarding benefits, she imagines that an exception will be made in this, in my case. She expects special favors. The storekeeper will give her a discount. The policeman will let her through without a pass. She's been taught to overestimate the value of her smile, and no one has told her that all women smile. And she says this shows why women don't succeed in building up a solid counter universe, whence they can challenge the males. Now and then they rail at men in general. They tell what happens in the bedroom or at childbirth. They exchange horoscopes and beauty secrets, but they lack the conviction necessary to build this grievance world. Their resentment calls for their attitude towards men is too ambivalent, meaning that it's not just an ambiguity within the masculine world. It's also interjected into women. And I want to close on something that she points out about this. She tells us, that none of women's traits manifest an originally perverted essence or will. They reflect a situation. There's dissimulation everywhere under a coercive regime, she says, quoting Fourier. And so as long as there are these male-dominated structures of society, which go on to form subjects who live according to a certain psychology, De, uh, depending upon this. And as long as this conflict is going on, this is going to be an ever present problem. Women won't get what they want. Men won't get what they want either. So this is a diagnosis on her part. But again, she's saying that it's the structure of society and the subjects within it that is inducing this.